blessing. Wow, there we are. It is a, a rich blessing to be here and to worship with you all. Fairview Baptist Church has become very near and dear, not just to my heart, but also to Grace Life Church. We are so grateful for your stand and your support in this season. We are just grateful for the love and affection you've shown us. We know you've prayed for us, and we are grateful for those prayers. And so I bring with me greetings from Grace Life Church in Edmonton. You have a a kindred church there in that city, and uh, we are just grateful that you are here in Calgary with the witness that you've provided and the stand that you've taken and the way that you have supported Pastor Tim. You need to know that um, I love Pastor Tim deeply. My affection for him is deep and is growing, and so I love you too, brother. You have, as I said last time, challenged me And so even the courage that Tim has shown has been contagious for me and has put steel in my own spine. And so we're just um, putting steel in each other's spine as we stand together. And uh, so what a joy and a privilege it is to be here with you all. And as I begin our time today in the Word of God, I want to begin by asking a, a series of questions What does it mean to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? What does it call for? What are the terms of discipleship? And who is it that sets the terms? What characteristics mark a follower of Jesus Christ? What does following him look like? And just how distinct is what he calls us to from the ways of this world. At present, we find ourselves in quite a unique period of time, and it's a curious one at that. At present, the marching orders of the world and the marching orders of many claiming to represent Christ are virtually indistinguishable. In fact, at present... The world is seeking to instruct the church in what it means to follow Christ. Just stop and think about that for a moment. Those who are dead in their trespasses and sins, those who are spiritually blind, those who are totally depraved, Those who are hostile toward God and totally committed to self want to instruct the church of Jesus Christ in what it means to follow after him. And oddly, many who actually claim to represent Christ are propagating what is virtually the same message to the extent that the world and much of the church have never been more unified have never been more in sync. And under normal circumstances, we could overlook that. Our expectations for the broader evangelical church are quite low. Many of those who claim to represent Christ, in fact, don't. They are either deceivers or are self-deceived. But what is difficult to overlook is that those who are typically committed to the authority of Scripture the honor and glory of Christ, and the call to be set apart from the world have joined the chorus as well. To be sure, they haven't necessarily in every case joined with their words, but they have with their actions and have walked in a manner that is no different from the course of this world. And so it's time to revisit the master's teaching. He sets the terms of discipleship. It's time to revisit what the Lord Jesus Christ calls of his disciples. He defines what it means to follow him. And so if you would, take your copy of God's word and open to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. And we're going to be focusing on verses 23 to 26. These are challenging words from the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so look with me at Luke 9 and verse 23. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and lose, loses or forfeits his, himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Now, as we come to this text, it's important to realize just how timely this is, not just for the broader issue of the day, but really even here for Fairview Baptist Church. This local church right here in Calgary has seen a significant amount of numerical growth. And the fact that you're here strongly suggests that you desire to follow after Christ, that you desire to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, in Luke 9, is addressing a crowd just like that. The, the very fact that the crowd was there to hear his teaching was evidence that they wanted to follow after Christ. They had an interest in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus, in this portion of Scripture, puts their desire to the test. And he does so by confronting them with the cost of discipleship. You see, some were there for all the wrong reasons. They were there for the show. They were there for the benefits. They were there because Jesus opposed the religious establishment. But all of that is superficial, and to expose it, Jesus lays down the demands of discipleship, in effect saying, if you want to be my disciple, this is what it's going to take. And so with Jesus, there is no bait and switch. There is no hiding the fine print. There's no putting the, the terms of discipleship in the, in the fine print where no one would notice. No, Jesus is not saving anything for later. It is time to count the cost of what it means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And really, as we come to these verses, it's important to understand that Jesus isn't making a distinction between the mature and the immature, as though there were two categories of disciples, the committed and the uncommitted. No, this is what it means to follow Christ. Later in Luke, Jesus will say, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And if you can't be his disciple, then you are not saved. And so Jesus is bringing challenging words to a, a crowd of people who have shown an interest in him and have expressed some measure of desire to follow after him which raises a natural question, what's the intended effect of this teaching? Why does Jesus lay down this teaching at this point in his ministry? Well, for one, to turn away those who deem the cost to follow after him too high. Some will hear this teaching, count the cost, and refuse the terms. It's just too costly for them. For two, to expose the superficial, to expose who are following Christ for all the wrong reasons. Jesus has no interest in perpetuating someone's self-deception. And for three, to further define the essence of true discipleship for his true disciples. That they would hear this teaching and bring their lives into greater conformity with it. The, the call to follow Christ is a call to obedience. And that means these verses describe the essence of saving faith. This is what saving faith looks like. This is what saving faith produces in the life of a true Christ Christian. It produces a life that reflects the lordship of Christ. And it's important to note the, the immediate context of this teaching. It comes in the context of the announcement 
of the impending death of Jesus. Look at verse 21, just the, the two verses earlier. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. So this teaching that we find here comes on the heels of Jesus declaring that he is going to die and that he's going to die at the hands of the religious establishment of Israel as well as the Roman political governing authority. Which means that just as his obedience resulted in death, so too must his disciples be willing to die. Following Christ not only means dying to self, it may mean dying for Christ. And so this is really a timely portion of Scripture. This is a much-needed message in our day, especially of those who claim to follow Christ and claim to love Christ and claim to be committed to the honor and glory of Christ As they claim that, this is going to be the the message that needs to sink in to really set the trajectory of what the future holds for us. And so what does it mean to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? What are the terms of discipleship? Well, if you're taking notes, jot down first the demands of discipleship. The demands of discipleship. Look at verse 23. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Note a couple of things at the outset. This is declared indiscriminately to all. It says, and he was saying to them all, to everyone in earshot of him, to all who had taken an interest in him. And since he continues even to this day to speak through his word, this is addressed to each of you as well. This is addressed to all. Note also Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me, if anyone wishes, and since they were there, as I said, we can assume they desired to do so. And the integrity of that desire, the the, the, the real validity of that desire is going to be tested in the words that come forth. Was it a true Holy Spirit generated desire to follow after Christ or was it worldly, fleshly, and uh, superficial rather? And since you're here, I presume that you have an inkling to follow Christ that you have a desire to follow Christ, that you want to follow Christ. And the integrity of that desire is to, to be tested this day. In addition, Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me, where to come after Christ is synonymous with following him. And so in effect, Jesus says, if anyone wishes to be my disciple, if anyone wishes to be a follower of me, And then Jesus lays down three demands that define what it means to follow him. Three demands that set forth the terms of discipleship. And the first is this, you must deny yourself. You must deny yourself. Verse 23, look at it again. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. You'll note this is a command. And it's calling for you to renounce yourself, to repudiate yourself. In effect, it is calling you to disown yourself. Each of us comes into this world intensely committed to self, to self-advancement, to self-preservation, where all that we do in one way or another or to one degree or another is geared toward self-exaltation. We are masters of our own domain, seeking to do what we want, when we want, how we want, prioritizing our own personal fulfillment and satisfaction. We rely on our own wisdom, lean on our own understanding, and live in a way that looks out for our own best interests. We're driven by self-ambition, full of self-entitlement, 
and we are even self-righteous. We believe coming into this world that we can actually secure the righteousness that is needed to stand holy and blameless before God. That we have the ability in ourselves to live in such a way that God would be impressed with us and would deem us worthy of heaven. That's how we come into this world. Committed to self, a high view of self. We love ourselves. And so Jesus is calling you to abandon yourself, to abandon self-autonomy, to abandon independence, and to subject yourself to the supreme rule of another. Jesus is calling you to come under his lordship, to submit to him as Lord, and to transfer everything that you are to him and say, what is thy bidding, my master? And that idea is expressed in the second demand. You must take up your cross daily. You must take up your cross daily. Look again at verse 23. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily. The cross was a Roman symbol of execution. Upon being condemned to death, a criminal was forced to carry his own cross. And he would carry it through the streets past many onlookers to the place of his execution. And so to carry one's cross signified they were condemned to death. In addition, it also signified submission to the state. It was Rome's way of making a public display of a state's claim on one's life. They had rebelled against the state. And the state was executing their punishment. And as they carried their cross, they would experience scorn and shame. They would experience hatred and hostility. And they would experience reproach and rejection. The Lord Jesus Christ himself experienced all of that. He was mocked and scorned as a criminal. And so the call here to take up your cross is a call to demonstrate your commitment and allegiance to Christ. To acknowledge the total claim he has on your life and to be willing to suffer whatever should come your way for doing so. It expresses submission to Christ and his authority. It provides an outward declaration that Jesus is Lord. And it demonstrates your willingness to die if need be. And Luke adds, daily. So this isn't a a one-time thing. This is a way of life for the true disciple of Jesus Christ. The true disciple of Christ must deny himself and must take up his cross daily. And so not only is Jesus calling you to disown yourself, he's calling you to demonstrate his lordship over your life by bearing your own cross, which is to live your life in such a way that your allegiance to him is evident to all, even subjecting yourself to persecution, reproach, and ridicule. And the call to live this way is further expressed in the third demand, you must follow him. You must follow him. Look again at verse 23. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What does it mean to follow Christ? It's to obey him. It's to obey his word. It's to walk in the same manner as he walked. In fact, that obedience is in view here, comes out in verse 26. Look at that. It says there, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. It's those who refuse to obey Christ that demonstrate they're ashamed of both him and his word. You see, by refusing to obey Christ, one can bypass the scorn and shame bypass all that goes along with taking up one's cross. They can blend in with the crowd and even make friendship with the world. And so one of the distinguishing marks of a true follower of Christ is obedience. 
to claim to follow Christ and not, and not obey him is a lie. First John 1, 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we what? We lie and do not practice the truth. So what is this calling for? This is calling for repentance as a way of life. This is calling for the regular ongoing confession of sin. This is calling you to be in the habit of putting sin to death. It's calling you to refuse the desires of the flesh. It's calling you to refuse ungodliness. It's calling you to refuse the, the, the applaud of the world, to reject everything the world offers to you as that which is valuable. It's calling you to saturate your life with the word of God. It's calling you to be a man or woman devoted to prayer. It's calling you to seek the interests of others ahead of your own. It's calling you to die yourself die to self and live for the honor and glory of Christ. This is what it means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there you have it. The terms of discipleship. You must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow Christ. And that means following in his footsteps being set apart from the world and testifying that its deeds are evil, which he did resulting in his own death and that by crucifixion. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds just a little bit different than the message that we're hearing today. And the message we're hearing from both the world and the church are again, virtually identical. They say, stay safe. Jesus says, be prepared to die a martyr's death. They say, stay home for the sake of grandma. Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26. They say loving your neighbor is the greatest commandment. Jesus says, on the contrary, loving the Lord your God with all your mind, soul, and strength is. They say, if you don't step in line, you're going to lose everything. Jesus says, so then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions, Luke 14, 33. In fact, look at what Jesus says later in this chapter. Just look at verse 59 and following. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Both the world and many in the church are selling a different Jesus. And though we would expect that from the world, you would expect the church to know just a little bit better that they would be able to recognize that if the the world is offering a certain Jesus and the, the Jesus they're offering looks virtually the same, then they've got the wrong Jesus. And so we've seen the demands of discipleship. And you might be thinking at this point in time, I mean, this is a tough sell. Why would anyone sign up for this? Why in the world would someone want to repudiate themselves, disown themselves, take up a cross daily, follow Christ, be willing to die a martyr's death, refuse the world, refuse fame, refuse riches? Why would anybody give up their life like that? And though Jesus is under no obligation to provide any incentive, he graciously does. And so if you're taking notes, jot down second, the incentive of discipleship. The incentive of discipleship. And there are two, two incentives that really mean the same thing, and they're expressed rather paradoxically. Look at verse 24. 
It says, for whoever wishes to save his life, and I want you to stop there. If you're following along with Jesus and you're hearing his words and you're understanding what it is that he's calling from you, then this is where your heart is going to go apart from divine grace. You're going to begin to go, wait a minute, what about me? What about my life? What about my goals and ambitions? What about my family? What about my home? What about my possessions, my career, my reputation, my comforts? If I follow Christ, I may lose everything. And so some will say, no, there's just no way. I can't do it. I won't do it. That's the response of someone who is seeking to save their life, to keep their life for themselves, to preserve self-autonomy, self-ambition, independence, the pursuit of worldly satisfaction and fulfillment, and the right to reign supreme over their own life. But look again at verse 24. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Oh, you'll keep your life now, but you'll lose it later. You'll keep your life temporally, but you'll lose it eternally. And the fact of the matter is, there are no guarantees for tomorrow. Your soul could be required of you this very day. And so you could be trying to hold on to this life and personal autonomy and independence and the the right to reign supreme over your own life, and you've got hours to go. And then you are ushered into a Christless, Christless eternity. And really, for some, their rejection of Christ is at this very point. Jesus describes them in in chapter 8 and verse 14. He says this, The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. It's the deceitfulness of riches, incredibly compelling in the fallen human heart. But, next part of verse 24, whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. You will lose your life temporally, but you will gain it eternally. Though you must disown yourself, though you must transfer all authority over your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, though you may suffer the loss of all things, your family, your home, your career, your possessions, your reputation, Though you may come under intense persecution, though you may even suffer death for the Lord Jesus Christ, you will deliver your soul from eternal hell by giving your life to Christ. I mean, Jesus is seeking to motivate the one who desires to come after him. Yes, there is a cost. Yes, it's going to cost you your life, but you will gain back in eternity everything and more. Verse 25, for what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? You have to realize nobody pursues the whole world. No one has it in their mind that they want the whole of the world. They would be just content with their own piece of the pie. They just want a little sliver of the pie. And so Jesus just cuts to the chase. He says, look, let's just go the the whole way. Let's say you could have the whole world, all of the riches of this world, all of the fame of this world, all of the prestige and notoriety. Let's say you had it all, everything this world had to offer. Let's say you had it all. Would you give up your soul for that? 
What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits his soul? Your soul is the most valuable thing you have. There is nothing more valuable to you than your soul. Your soul will have an eternity, and it's the only eternity you will ever have. And you will either have that with the Lord Jesus Christ in glory, or you will have that in eternal hell. You could have the whole world, and it wouldn't matter. It's not worth the value of your soul. And so Jesus is talking like an accountant. He's saying, put the the whole world over here in the gains column and put your soul over here in the loss column and you are eternally bankrupt. You have nothing. You could have this whole world and lose your soul and you have nothing. And we'll spend all of eternity suffering under the judgment of God. And so the cost is great. Yes, this will cost you your life. Yes, you will have to deny yourself. Yes, you will have to take up a cross daily and follow Christ. Yes, you will have to be willing to die for the sake of Christ. But though the cost is great, the reward is exceedingly greater. Now, the truth of the matter is, I don't know exactly where everyone's at which is kind of a bit of a benefit for me in this moment. But let's say you're here and you haven't yet believed on Christ, or you're here and you're being confronted with the demands of what it is to follow Christ, and you're beginning to question, maybe I haven't actually believed on Christ. Well, in that place, let me ask you this. What is it that's holding you back? If you are held back from coming to Christ by faith, what is it? What is it that is keeping you from coming to him? And then ask yourself, is that worth your eternal soul? Are you willing to sacrifice your soul for that thing? Whatever it is, it isn't worth forfeiting your soul. So we've seen the, the demand of, this, of discipleship. We've seen the incentive of discipleship. And if you're taking notes, jot down third, the vindication of discipleship. The vindication of discipleship. This comes out in verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Jesus is coming back. And when he comes, he will come in blazing glory. And when he does, his true disciples will be vindicated. And the context here is key. It goes without saying that those who reject Christ will be judged. It goes without saying that those who refuse to even make a profession of faith in Christ will be judged. So when Jesus says this, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, he's talking to the, the crowd who are there who are demonstrating some desire to follow after him. And so to claim Jesus and yet be ashamed of him and his words is not going to go well for you. The word ashamed means to experience a painful feeling or sense of loss of status. To put it in the positive, Paul declares, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, Romans 1.16, which is to say... He experiences no sense of loss or status, uh, no sense of loss of status on account of the gospel. Paul does not deem himself to be any the lesser on account of the gospel. He is not ashamed of the gospel. He does not care whether there is reproach that comes to him on account of the gospel. He is not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. 
And so those who are ashamed of Christ and his words experience an internal sense of a loss of status. They would prefer to not be associated with Christ. And so they either fail to confess him before men or they modify his teaching to accommodate him to the culture. And what you must understand is that you cannot separate Christ from his word. Who Christ is and what he says are inseparable. And so here's the temptation. That as the world becomes more and more hostile to Christ, that those who profess him would attempt to make him more acceptable. So as to avoid a sense of a loss of status. To accommodate him to the world. So as to make him more appealing to worldly sensibilities. And that is happening on a massive scale in our day. To the extent that those who profess Christ have avoided bearing the reproach of Christ. They have essentially accommodated Jesus to the world to such an extent that there's no reproach for them. There's no persecution for them. There's no ridicule, no shame. There's no hatred and hostility. They have basically manufactured a Jesus that the world likes. And Jesus says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory. The cost of following Christ is increasing. But the cost of being ashamed of him and his words is exceedingly and eternally greater. And so let me appeal to your heart for a moment. If you wish to come after Christ, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow him. You must die to self. Your life must be marked by obedience to his word. Your relationship to Christ must take precedence over every other relationship to the extent that it is as if you would hate your own father, mother, brother, sister, and yes, even your own life, which means you must be willing to lose the people that are most near and dear to you for the sake of Christ. You must recognize that all that you have is actually his, and that you are merely a steward of what he's entrusted to you, which is to say, you must be willing to give up all your possessions should he require that of you. And not only that, you must be willing to die a martyr's death, which is to say that you must be willing to die for the sake of Jesus Christ. There needs to be a willingness to stand for Christ and receive whatever it is that's going to come your way. This is what it costs to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. But though you will lose your life now, you will gain it back for all of eternity. And so the question is before you. Do you wish to follow after Christ? Do you wish to come after him? Do you wish to be his disciple? If you do, then it begins with turning from sin and believing on him. You need to understand that when Jesus says this, when when he looks at the crowd and he says to the crowd, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. He is essentially calling them to something they are incapable of. In order to deny yourself and take up this cross and follow Christ, you must be born from above. You need a second birth. You need the Spirit of God to reach into your heart, remove the heart of stone, replace it with a heart of flesh that beats for God, whereby you would see the glory and honor of Christ, would understand that you are a sinner condemned to hell and would look to Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross as the only basis by which you have a right standing before God. 
all of us, as you know, come into this world dead in sin, committed to our own way, even as we've read this morning, going astray. We come under the, the, the law of God and realize that we are sinners condemned to hell, that we have broken God's holy law, that we have come short of the glory of God. And if God had left it there, we would be finished. We would be ruined. There would be no hope. But what God did was he sent forth his son. And his son came to take upon himself human flesh. And he lived under the law of God. And he fulfilled the law in all respects. And he he was tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. And he proclaimed the truth of God. And the religious leaders of that time deemed him a criminal, deemed him a blasphemer. And they took him and they put him on a cross and they crucified him. And though he experienced immense human suffering while on that cross, the real deal was that God the Father was pouring out his righteous wrath and indignation on Christ for all who would ever believe on his name. And Jesus, on that cross, as the sin-bearing servant, the the, the sin-bearing sufferer, he took upon himself that sin, swallowed up that wrath, atone for sin in full. And then he died. And he went into the grave. And he rose on the third day. And then he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And he is there now, awaiting the command to return in blazing glory. And if you would turn from your sin this day, and you would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And you will deny yourself. And you will take up a cross. And you will follow Christ. And you will be given the, the, the power source within you by the Spirit of God who will take up residence in you to live the life that you could never live, to live the life that Jesus is calling for right here, where you would not be ashamed of the gospel, not ashamed of Christ, not ashamed of his words, where you would take a stand on the word of God and for the honor and glory of Christ and live for him. And if you are in Christ already, because you have been in Christ for some time, then let this be a moment that calls you to obedience, a moment that calls you to search your heart, to evaluate whether your life is reflecting the Lordship of Christ. Have you denied yourself? Have you taken up a cross? Are you doing that daily? Are you following him? Have you put him first in your life? Are you seeking to obey his word, to be conformed more fully into his image? Let this call you unto deeper obedience, deeper commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would be honored and glorified, and that you would be made ready to stand in the evil day. Because the evil day is upon us. The cost to follow Christ is increasing. And you need to settle this matter in your heart now, that you are going to take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, a stand for his honor and glory and entrust yourself to him even as you come up against all of the injustice that will come your way. And you will do it for the glory of God. And when you die, you will enter into his presence and you will enter into the joy of your master and he will embrace you with open arms and say, well done, good and faithful slave. And so be encouraged to live for the Lord, to follow after him, to not be ashamed of him or his words and to delight in the reproach that would come to you for following him. Let's pray together. Well, Father, we just acknowledge the strength of the words of our Lord. These are words that challenge us. They call us to commitment, to obedience, to self-denial, to die to self, to live for Christ, to live for you, to do so in the face of hostility, to do so in the face of shame and scorn, reproach and ridicule. And so, Father, we need your grace. We want to make our Savior proud. We want to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel worthy of you, worthy of him. And so, Father, we pray that you would work in our hearts this day.
stir within us what needs to be addressed. That we would confess our sin, deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.